My next guest is no stranger to China's music scene, being a founding member of China's first heavy metal band, Tang Dynasty. Kaiser Kuo is now the editor-at-large of American-based China-focused media company, SubChina. He's also the host of the Chinese current affairs podcast, Sinica, and joins me now from North Carolina. Kaiser, I understand you've got a bit of a connection to Australia. You were once in an ACDC cover band in Beijing, of all places. Yeah, I was. It was called The Dirty Deeds, and there wasn't an Australian among us. But uh, yeah, grew up listening to Akadaka, you know, in, in, in middle school. So uh, very fond of that stuff. It's not something, is it, that our minds immediately go to when we think about China, and that is a, a thriving rock scene. But it does exist. How much does it have in common, though, with the sort of subversive nature of rock that we find in the West? Yeah, I think the analogy is to the role that rock music played in the West can only take you so far. Rock was a, a, a was transculturated. It was a transplant. It, it's very much, you know, a foreign idiom, but, uh, and it, it grew differently in Chinese soil. Uh, that said, uh, I think that we, we should expect a music like rock to thrive in adversity, right? I mean, it, 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 uh, it needs to have something to push against, whether that's politically or, in, as is the case in China, often socially, just at the kind of conformity in Chinese society. Uh, that's great. I mean, and, you know, so it, it has some of that same spirit very much. It does go to that paradox, doesn't it? And something that you've written about here. It's a country that's very heavily weighted with its history, but capable of great renewal. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, that's something that I would see as sort of the central paradox. There are many people like to talk about lands of contradictions and things like that. But uh, for China, the one at the heart of it is, as you say, between the fact that China is at once, like no other country really, freighted by its history, just weighed down by history, burdened by history. But at the same time, China and it's you know manifestly true. You just look at uh, the skylines of these Chinese cities, and it looks like it's capable of instantaneous you know uh, transformation. It can turn on a dime, as they say. I often say, you know, like if it, under that many G's of acceleration, I'd fall on my on my on my posterior. But uh, the Chinese people seem to be able to navigate it. The, both of these things are true. Uh, the the way that I think you can think about it is that look. Uh, Externally, the hardware uh, they have made obvious, you know, gigantic advances in, but the software may, may not be there. I have a teenage son, for example, and I, I look at, you know, he's a tall and broad shouldered kid. He looks, you know, pretty grown up, but, you know, I know better, right? I know what's, what's actually, my, and I wouldn't expect him to, there to be a match between his sort of emotional maturity inside you know, his intellect or whatever, and then, and the external. Now, I don't mean that to deprecate China in any way. But, uh, the, the metaphor I keep going to is this movie from, I can't remember, the 1990s, I guess, with Tom Hanks in it, the movie Big. The Overgrown Child. Yeah, The Overgrown Child, right, exactly. So as you remember from that film, uh, Tom Hanks makes a wish, he's a kid, and he makes a wish to be an adult overnight. And yeah, sure enough, he wakes up in his bunk bed and scares the hell out of his mother, and he was this full-grown adult. And people sort of expect him to act like an adult, but of course, he still has the mentality of the 12 or 13 year old that he was. Now, again, I do not mean to disparage shining this. This is just, um, it's just a mismatch between uh, this in this single biological generation, how we've seen so much advancement uh, in the hardware, in the, you know, in, whether it's uh, the, the architecture of the cities or uh, the, the technology, but not. And I think this goes really far to explain why China Chinese people can seem so so very thin skinned, why they seem to react almost in a sort of national uh, kind of coordinated spasm to uh, uh, perceived insults and things like that. China has been called Kaiser a, a fragile superpower, um, and that is a bit of a, a paradox of the country, isn't it? Very strong, but also very sensitive. An authoritarian country on the verge of great political power, and now we enter into this, what many are saying is a new Cold War era and the potential for great misunderstanding. So understanding all of that, how should we navigate this period of history? Right. Uh, it is, and it is a precarious moment. There's no question about that. There are many flashpoints right now. Uh, there's a lot, there's a gigantic chasm of misunderstanding. 
I, I keep going back to this idea of cognitive empathy. Uh, I think that we really need to try to to see what the world looks like, like out through Beijing's windows. We need to understand, you know, how our behaviors in the United States look, uh, and they don't always look benign. Sometimes they look downright threatening, and we need to understand that uh, it's not the simple emotional empathy that we're all capable of naturally. It requires us to actually lo- know something about the lived experience of Chinese people, know something about the history that forms their values, their beliefs, their habits of mind, and the other way around as well. I mean, I would urge uh, my Chinese interlocutors to do exactly the same because there's very little understanding of how Americans perceive the world in China as well. There may be an opportunity for greater convergence and, and greater understanding of each other, but is it not also a fact that there are red lines? There are areas where Western values and Chinese values or politics clash. We talk about issues such as human rights, what's happening in Xinjiang, what's happening in Hong Kong uh, as well. How should the West deal with those red lines when facing a country now as powerful as China? So that's exactly what I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about these these flashpoints in these areas uh, of, of misunderstanding. I think that, for example, uh, Beijing really doesn't understand uh, how heartfelt uh, the anguish is about the way that the Uyghurs have, have suffered in Xinjiang. I mean, I think that there's a tendency now to just believe in Beijing, to believe that that whole discourse was simply weaponized, that it, it's insincere, that it, it it represents not just you know abject hypocrisy, but that that it, it's been ginned up in a deliberate effort to discredit China, uh, Hong Kong as well. Uh, the, these are issues that I think the Chinese just have a, a great deal of difficulty understanding uh, the, the depth of, of of sentiment here. Then there is the question of Taiwan. And we know from the West there is real concern about potential conflict there. Xi Jinping has talked about reunifying Taiwan by force if necessary. But can I flip that and see what it looks like from a Chinese perspective? Would China be prepared to go that far to settle the Taiwan question? So this is a very, very huge question, and I certainly don't have all the answers to it. But I I would uh, just talk about a couple of things here. One is that uh, Beijing is realistic about the difficulty involved in this. I mean, I don't think it wants to inherit just a, a burned out shell of an island. I, obviously, it, uh, it, you know, its optimal outcome is still one in which somehow the compatriots in Taiwan return willingly to the fold under the auspices of the one country, two systems uh, system, which, of course, to most observers is completely inoperable, especially after what we've seen in in Hong Kong. So this is a a big disconnect, but uh, because they they understand what a gamble such an adventure would be, uh, and because Xi has arrogated to himself so much authority, I think there's, I I mean, it's not a popular idea, but I think that um, it's actually a curb on Xi's adventurism. He understands that he would bear all of the blame for a failure, and that would be absolutely the end of a political life where, where he to try and, and try unsuccessfully. Uh, the costs are simply too high. And I think that's reason for the United States to want to keep the costs very high. I, I think that, that a deterrent effect is still something that, you know, very important. I know that there are people uh, who maybe would champion a more sort of appeasement uh, approach to it. I, I'm not one of them uh, in, in this case. But I think it's at the same time important to see uh, how Beijing understands the entire issue of Taiwan and uh, the United States' role in it. They really do believe uh, that the United States is going back on something that they had agreed to, that the entire uh, you know, opening to China, Nixon and Kissinger in, in the early 1970s and 71, 72, uh, leading up to you know, the actual normalization of relations in 1980, that whole period. Uh, and that whole was, was made entirely possible by uh, the three communiques, by the, this idea that uh, the U.S. would respect this idea of a, a single China. And there were ambiguities built into it, and both sides understood this. But they believe that the United States, is, especially during the Trump administration, even before the Trump administration started, uh, has, has, has been salami slicing this, has been, you know, uh, 
pushing as as far as it can uh, to to change the the actual terms of the agreement. And it's very understandable that the United States would want to do that. After all, the Taiwan that was uh, you know sort of given away as it, you know in, in the view of a lot of a lot of Americans in the 1970s, it was not a democratic Taiwan. Uh, in, in 1972, Ch- Taiwan Taiwan was still under martial law. Uh, and it was ruled by a single party authoritarian state, authoritarian party. And now uh, Taiwan has become, in the years since, a full-fledged, vibrant democracy uh, that's very much worth, worthy of our admiration and respect. So uh, again, this isn't something that that a lot that that Beijing has internalized. It doesn't understand uh, how American values, Western values. Uh, play into our thinking about what the fate of Taiwan ought to be. It's a very difficult situation. Kaiser, as someone who has traversed both sides of this, Chinese, brought up in America, you've lived uh, in China as well. How do you see this hinge point of history, uh, particularly Xi Jinping's ambition, when he talks about a China dream? What does that mean? Does that mean to usurp American power? Does that mean to live in a multipolar world? Or are we talking about China dominating the world, a Chinese hegemony? What does this look like from a Chinese perspective? Yeah, I, I think of the three options that you laid out, it's certainly the one that, that gets best at it is uh, China living in a multipolar world uh, with a sort of um, regional hegemony with, you know, dominance, the, the sort of the top of the pecking order in its neighborhood in East Asia within the first island chain, as they like to say, um, you know, to re-attain its historical role, what it sees as its historical role as sort of top dog regionally. But, um, you know, I think that, that, that a lot of people have exaggerated this and have, have said that, you know, China seeks to truly supplant the U.S. as a new global hegemon. I think, you know, nobody is more aware of the, the limitations and, you know, the lack of appetite for this than the Chinese themselves. There's no, no, no such desire. Uh, and yeah, I think that um, within that, that realm, they want their, their power to be essentially unchallenged. Yeah. Kaiser Guo, thanks again for your time. Much appreciated. My pleasure entirely.